Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm uh, Tom Patterson. I'm one of the co-founders of the uh, Boston Global Forum. Um, I want to thank, uh, to get started this morning, to thank Tuan for putting together this wonderful program today, and, uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, we've got a pretty full morning. Uh, we've got a little bit of a late start. Uh, uh, Mike was caught up in traffic, uh, so uh, the Boston traffic isn't always very forgiving. So uh, Uber was expected to be here by 8.30, and uh, so we're running a little on the late side. But um, we really have a full uh, day today. I think we have uh, three videos, uh, I think uh, two citations, uh, uh, between 15 and 20 speakers, hopefully short uh, addresses. But uh, the uh, And every year at, uh, at this conference, the fall conference, uh, we can find, uh, we give our, 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 our Peace and Security Award, Boston Global Forum's Peace and Security Award. Um, and this year we did it a little bit differently. Uh, we did it outside the confines of this room. Uh, we did it at India, in India at the C2, uh, or C20, G20 meeting. Um, and uh, the recipient this year is Ama, uh, uh, the Indian uh, spiritual leader. Uh, and founder of homeless shelters, health clinics, hospital, uh, world-class university, and much more. Um, and we'd like to start today by sharing you with you a video from the event in India. In July, during the Civil 20 Summit in Jaipur, the keynote speaker on technology, education, and empowerment, Sri Ngyan Nguyen Tuan, informed Amma that his organization, the Boston Global Forum, wanted to bestow upon Amma its 2023 World Leader for Peace and Security Award. The core focus of Boston Global Forum is forming a social contract and international law regarding the use of artificial intelligence. The award, which is presented jointly by Boston Global Forum and the Michael Dukakis Institute for Leadership and Innovation, will be presented to Amma in recognition of her remarkable contributions to global peace, spirituality, and compassion. In the words of former Governor Dukakis, we are profoundly honored to recognize Amma as a world leader for peace and security. Her tireless efforts to promote love, compassion, and global unity are truly exemplary. Amma's legacy will continue to inspire our collective journey towards a more harmonious world. Former recipients of the esteemed award include Dr. Ursula Gertrude von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, former Chancellor of Germany Angela Merkel, and former Prime Minister of Japan Shinzo Abe. Let us now watch a brief video about this award. Welcome to the presentation of the 2023 World Leader for Peace and Security Award. This prestigious recognition is a joint initiative of the Boston Global Forum and the Michael Dukakis Institute. It is an honor bestowed upon those who have made remarkable contributions to global peace and security. Today, we come together to celebrate an individual especially for her profound compassion, unyielding dedication to spiritual values and influential global leadership. Sri Mata Amritanandamai Devi, founder of M.A. Mat, M.A. Centers, Embracing the World, Amrita Hospitals, and Chancellor Amrita Vishwavidyapitam, fondly known as Amma, who embodies the essence of harmony and safety to millions around the world. Today, we are deeply honored to recognize Amma for her tireless effort to promote love and global unity. Rendai Rendai Rati Rubati Munile, 
Global Leader for Peace and Security Award അമ്മയ്ക്ക് സമർപ്പിക്കുന്നതിനായി ബോസ്റ്റൺ ഗ്ലോബൽ ഫോറം കോ ഫൗണ്ടറും സിഇഒയുമായ ന്യൂൻ ആൻഡ് ഖാങ് അദ്ദേഹത്തെ ആദരവോടെ വേദിയിലേക്ക് ക്ഷണിക്കുന്നു ശ്രീ ന്യൂൻ ആൻഡ് ഖാങ് the co-founder and ceo of boston global forum will now present the 2023 world leader for peace and security award to our beloved amma ellavarum ellavarum swasthanangalil ezhunettu ninnu ammakku labhikkunna ee aadaravine bahumanikkanam ennu ormippikkunnu let us all honor this moment by standing and giving a huge round of thunderous applause to celebrate this special moment ammakku labhicha ഈ അവാർഡ് പ്രാർത്ഥനാപൂർവ്വം നമുക്ക് ഓരോരുത്തർക്കും ഏറ്റുവാങ്ങാം Amma has uh, graced us uh, by providing uh, a video um, and uh, the introducing it will be uh, Swami Puri uh, Swami respected governor and all distinguished guests gathered here today uh, i'll just uh, give you a brief introduction about uh, what amma does as you have already seen um, one of the main things that she does is she travels all around the world and she has hugged more than 39 million people in the last 40 years and uh, she has she continues to do so and not only that uh, from that uh, uh, her interactions with the individuals uh, has uh, come out all these uh, different charitable uh, activities and organizations which have been conducted by volunteers from more than uh, 60 countries i'd like to uh, just uh, briefly uh, apologize because uh, amma could not come here herself and accept the award and uh, i would like to uh, give a special uh, message to the governor and amma wishes him a uh, happy birthday for his 90th b- birthday and her prayers for uh, his uh, good health and a long life so uh, without much ado let's uh, watch amma's message and thank you all പ്രമസ്വരുകളും ആത്മസ്വരുകളായിരിക്കുന്ന എല്ലാവർക്കും നമസ്കാരം അമ്മ ബൗസ് ഡൗൺ ടു ഓൾ ഓഫ് യു ഹു ആർ എംബോഡിമെന്റ്സ് ഓഫ് പ്യുർ ലവ് ആൻഡ് ദ സുപ്രീം സെൽഫ് അറ്റ് ദി ഔട്ട് സെറ്റ് അമ്മ വിഷസ് ടു താങ്ക് ദ ബോസ്റ്റൺ ഗ്ലോബൽ ഫോറം ഫോർ കൺഫറിംഗ് ദിസ് പ്രസ്റ്റീജിയസ് അവാർഡ് ഓൺ ഹെർ അമ്മ ഫീൽസ് ദാറ്റ് ഇഫ് ഷീ ഹാസ് മെയ്ഡ് എ പോസിറ്റീവ് ഇമ്പാക്ട് ഓൺ ദ വേൾഡ് ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് സോൺലി ബിക്കോസ് ഷീ ഹാസ് ചിൽഡ്രൻ who have chosen to selflessly love and serve others therefore this acknowledgement and accolade should actually go to them amma's only wish is to offer solace to the suffering wipe their tears and comfort them until her last breath god has bestowed upon living beings an exquisite and eternal divine flower this undying flower is our soul shelter planet earth Our earth has an amazing power to provide us everything we need to overcome any challenge thrown at us by the changing seasons and weather. But God has also made us responsible for taking care of earth and ensuring that her beauty, color, vitality and fragrance do not fade. What are we doing instead? Are we protecting this rare boon or ruining it? Externally the gap between man and machine is decreasing. 
Internally, revenge, hatred, and anger are eating away at the human mind. With advancements in science, man has learned to fly like a bird and swim like a fish, but has forgotten how to walk and live like a human being. We end up destroying ourselves when we fail to handle science and technology with proper discernment. Science and technology do not have any awareness or discerning power of their own. We need to have the right values to direct them. Humans believe that they can conquer the entire universe using science and human intelligence. This is similar to the ignorance of a child who sees the sky through his bedroom window and claims it to be his own. In reality, what man's intelligence has discovered is nothing but a small speck of this infinite universe. Human beings are like waves that frolic on the surface of the boundless ocean, yet know nothing of its depth or vastness. Waves are born and die in the ocean. All living beings are waves in this infinite ocean that is God. We are born, live, and die in this infinite ocean. Just as the wave and the ocean are essentially one, man, nature, and God are essentially the same. Our internal and external conflicts, the greed to own everything, and feelings of revenge and hatred are all a reflection of our lack of understanding of this oneness. Logic and intellect are all that we need to understand how to use machines, but in order for our awareness to expand, we need an all-encompassing perspective. Spirituality is the path to expanding our outlook. It teaches us about ourselves. Modern science now accepts that everything in the universe is interconnected. However, it is often scientists that are discriminatory and divisive in their perception. Amma remembers a story. On a very hot day, two workers were digging a well. One of them pointed to the supervisor who was relaxing under a nearby tree and said to his friend, Hey, look, we're working so hard while that guy is just cooling off under a tree. How is that fair? Go ask him yourself, replied the second worker. The first worker dropped his shovel and walked to the supervisor. We're working so hard in this heat while you just get to cool off in the shade. Why? Logic and intelligence, replied the supervisor. Intelligence? How is that? asked the worker. Allow me to demonstrate, replied the supervisor. I'll keep my hand on this tree trunk. Hit it with all you've got. The disgruntled worker summoned all his energy and slammed down a powerful punch. But just before the punch landed, the supervisor withdrew his hand and the worker's knuckle crashed into the tree. Nursing his broken hand, he went back to his job. What did he say? asked the second worker. Oh, he said it was intelligence, replied the first. What does that mean? asked the second worker. The first worker looked around but did not see a tree nearby. Keeping his good hand on his own cheek, he said to the second worker, hit my hand. With all his strength, the second worker hit the first worker's cheek with his shovel. The first worker withdrew his hand at the last minute and the blow landed smack on his face. Many of us are like this foolish worker endangering our own existence with our indiscriminate thoughts and actions. Once a woman came crying to Amma. My daughter is depressed because she is almost blind, she cried. She was fine until the COVID pandemic hit. Then during lockdown, she shut herself in a room, watching shows and playing games on her phone. She would not even come out to eat. When we tried to make her take a break, she flung the phone and broke it on purpose. She then refused to eat until we bought her a new phone. This trend continued again and again. She wouldn't eat or sleep, and in this way she went through five phones. When we finally took away the phone, she started using her laptop. She has already broken two of them. Now she suffers from mental illness and is unable to even go to school. What should we do? Thousands of children suffer from such mental illness. Even the best things are only good in moderation. Devices are great tools when used for studies and moderate entertainment. But what's the result of indiscriminate use? 
Children follow their desires, ultimately leading to their own destruction. This trend needs to be brought under control. There are two types of education, education for living and education for life. Education for living is needed to earn financial stability. Education for life is the science of facing trials and tribulations. It is essentially spirituality and this helps us to learn how to interact with the world and its attractions. An elephant is an elephant and a horse is a horse. We need to see each as they are instead of viewing the elephant as a horse and vice versa. Amma is not undermining the importance of science and technology. We need to maintain a proper perspective and see everything in its own place. The increase in global population has led to rising global hunger as well as mortality due to disease. This prompted researchers to find practical solutions to these problems. Through research, six-month crops are now harvested in three months. Cows capable of giving two liters of milk were modified to yield up to 20 liters a day. Most cattle receive antibiotics to prevent diseases. People started adding 75% toxic chemicals to the soil instead of the permissible 5%. We need a healthy body to have a healthy mind. But polluted foods lead to so many diseases and it's now hard to find safe food. Research started with a compassionate intent, but now our indiscrimination has led to harm. Science and technology should be able to uplift the common person. In many remote villages, there is a shortage of electricity, so we've been able to provide them with solar power. Our university has used technology and haptics to provide vocational training to hundreds and thousands of women. Where schools are distant and transportation is unavailable, children were provided with online classes. Many farmers had encountered years of loss in crop, forcing them to sell their houses and property, driving many to even suicide. We taught them modern farming met methods that helped them recuperate their losses and earn a profit in their very first year. Technology remains the same, but it's us who need to decide whether to use it to benefit or harm our society. Nowadays, our pursuit primarily centers around desires rather than necessities. Desires and needs are two separate things. We should recognize the difference. For example, a $100 watch and a $100,000 watch will both show the correct time. Telling time is their purpose. The $100 watch is what we need, but the $100,000 watch is just a desire. Amma doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't wear an expensive watch, that's up to us. Amma is just giving an example to illustrate how taking only what we need can aid us in helping others. Understanding spirituality encourages people to fulfill their needs, but to use their discernment when it comes to mere desires. It makes us content with what we have. The English word culture has many meanings. We send a small sample of blood or sputum to the lab for culturing, creating the optimal environment for bacteria in the sample to grow. Similarly, culture also refers to inner growth. For this inner growth to happen, we first need to create a conducive atmosphere at home, then later at school. Amma would like to narrate an incident that happened to one of the hundreds of ashram children an example of how spiritual values imparted early can influence our lives positively. There is a child who lives in the ashram. She really wanted a specific doll. She cried and fussed and finally her mother bought her the doll for her birthday. A few days later, it was another girl's birthday. The little girl gleefully gave her doll to the other child as a birthday present. Seeing this, Amma asked her, you cried so much to get this doll. What made you then decide to give it away? The little one replied, Well, she doesn't have a mother. She may also want a doll like this, right? But who will buy it for her? So that's why I gave her mine. Didn't it make you sad? Amma asked. No, she replied. I actually felt much happier giving her the doll than when I received it myself. 
when we understand spiritual principles, we begin to see the sorrows and joys of others as our own. Just as the sun does not need the support of candlelight to shine, God needs nothing from us. Like we caress our left hand with our right hand, we should be able to feel the pain of others as our own and reach out to console them. Universities should try to instill these values in youth. In recent years, our university has sent around 4,000 students to remote villages on student internships. When our students personally witness the day-to-day -day hardships of the villagers, genuine compassion blossoms in at least 10% of them. This has prompted them to do righteous and charitable activities whenever possible. We all have the spark of compassion within us. We just need to awaken this. Human beings and nature are interconnected. It is compassion that keeps everything connected. If this compassion dries up, everything will be lost. In a small pond adjacent to their house, a family cultivated fish to supplement their household income. Many storks and other fishing birds frequented the area. To prevent them from carrying away the fish, a net was laid over the surface of the pond. The pond was surrounded by trees. One day, a frog reached the pond. He tried to jump in, but the net prevented him from entering the water. He saw his relatives in the pond. He was hungry and looked around for some mosquitoes to eat. He saw a goat tied under one of the trees. The frog said to the goat, I'm so hungry, but all the mosquitoes are in the pond. When I left this pond, the net was not there, and now I cannot get in. Can you please help me move the net so I can get in? The goat looked at the frog and bleated. That's your problem, not mine. The frog then approached a pig and asked him the same thing. The pig squealed again. That's your problem, not mine. The frog finally approached the cow, but it also mooed. That's your problem, not mine. No one helped the frog get back into the pond. By noon, the woman of the house came out to the pond to catch some fish for lunch. She didn't notice a snake had been trapped in the net and accidentally stepped on it. The snake bit the woman and she was taken to the hospital. The doctors saved her life, but she was still very weak. She was prescribed goat liver soup to help her recover. The family goat was sacrificed for its liver. In a few days, the woman regained enough strength to come home. All of her relatives dropped in to see her and the pig was sacrificed to feed them. A few days later, the woman's health took a sudden turn for the worst and she died. The tree beside the pond was cut to make a coffin. Finally, the cow was killed to feed all the guests who came to attend her memorial service. Actually, if any one of them had felt a little compassion for the frog, no one would have been killed. It is compassion that supports all of life. There is a rhythm to this universe, an imperishable connection between the universe and every living creature within it. This universe is like a vast interconnected network. If a net is shaken in one place, the vibration is felt throughout. Similarly, whether we are aware of it or not, all of our actions reverberate throughout creation, be they performed as an individual or as a group. We are not individual islands, but links on a common chain. There is no use in saying, we will change if others change. On the other hand, if we change, we will be able to bring change to the rest of the world. Changing our internal attitude will bring change to our external circumstances as well. In life, there are certain things that we can change and certain others that we just have to accept. For example, Someone whose genes dictate a height of five feet will not grow any taller, even if he eats more, takes supplements, or hangs upside down. In such situations, we should practice acceptance. However, in other situations where our effort can help, we should try hard to progress. For example, if we fail an exam, we will not abandon our studies, right? We will try again and retake the exam. Three factors are needed to make any action successful. They are the proper time, self-effort, and God's grace. For example, a man has to travel a long distance in order to attend an auction. So he wakes up early and starts for the airport. 
Maybe on his way, his car breaks down or he meets with a small accident and ends up missing his flight. Despite the proper time and effort from his part, he's still unsuccessful because the factor of grace was not in his favor. Divine grace is required to make any action sweet and meaningful. To get grace, we need to perform good deeds. We should learn to have gratitude towards everything in life. We are indebted to everything in this world, to all the creatures that helped us grow and made us who we are today. This earth is our mother. Nature is our mother. We should never forget our debt to our mother. We should not walk away refusing to pay heed to the cries of our brothers and sisters in pain. We should do whatever we can to help them. To help those in need, we may not need a high position or wealth. All we need to do is offer a loving word, a compassionate glance, and a helping hand. Just these simple acts can make our life and theirs both bright as well as meaningful. It is what we give, not what we take, that determines the value of our life. If we can bring even a moment of happiness to just one person's life, it will greatly enrich our own. May all of you, Amma's dear children, be able to achieve this. May divine grace bless you all. One of uh, Amma's many achievements is to found uh, Amrita University. Uh, it's a very young university, uh, 20 years old, uh, and in that relatively short period of time, uh, it has risen to the top ranks of India's universities. Um, and it's a distinctive university. Uh, its students uh, work on a curriculum, uh, and in every program, uh, there's a dedication to the UN's social development goals, uh, the concept of education for life, which he talked about in the video, uh, underpins the uh, curriculum, uh, and the notion of public service. Her example of 4,000 students going out uh, to rural villages uh, to render services to those villages. Um, the university uh, unleashed uh, or announced a number of initiatives at the C20, G20, uh, somewhat in, uh, in uh, India uh, in September, uh, and uh, has a desire and an interest, as do we, uh, working with uh, the Boston Global Forum. Um, and uh, to talk about those initiatives is uh, Dr. Achu Than uh, from uh, Emerita University. There you are. I couldn't see her around the corner. <laughs> Thank you. A very good morning to everybody. My warmest greetings to all. My uh, special wishes to Governor Dukakis for his uh, 90th birthday. And a, and a very uh, special thank you to our hosts, uh, Mr. Tuan Nguyen from Boston Global Forum, Dr. Tom Patterson, and others here. It's an absolute pleasure to be here and to share with you the experience of actually having gone through the entire Civil 20 deliberations as part of India's uh, presidency. And that's what my presentation will cover with a brief introduction of the university, which actually Tom uh, summarized quite well. Um, next slide, please. So as everybody knows, uh, G20, in fact, this name is undergoing a change as we speak. It's actually going to become G21, with the African Union being part of it as well, is, is representing um, a significant part of the globe in terms of the 85% of global GDP, 75% of the global trade, and also two-thirds of the world's population. And these numbers will change as we speak. And uh, as part of the G20, there were several engagement groups. One of the most prominent ones, next slide please, is the Civil 20. The Civil 20 really aspires to voice 
the people's voices as part of civil society organizations to the leaders of the G20. And the logo that was actually provided by um, the organization that was led by Amma, who was the chairman of the Civil 20, had also very symbolic value. It said, you are the light. And what this symbolizes is the flame of hope, self-motivation, and selfless service to remind us of the fact that we may always never see the exact results of what we desired for. However, our work still sheds positive light on the world in terms of our effort. Next slide, please. This time, Civil 20 was a very large group of uh, 16 engagement groups underneath the Civil 20, and it had very, very broad, uh, comprehensive focus, working, looking at integrated holistic health, to sustainable and resilient communities, to gender equality, to education, digital transformation, technology, security, transparency, amongst others. And uh, uh, just to touch a little bit on the host institution itself, um, Amrita Vishwadhyaya Peetam, next slide, please, is a very young, fast-growing university in India. And as mentioned by Amma and Tom here, we have a three-part vision. Next slide, please which is to look at education for life, going beyond education for living, looking at compassion-driven research, and also global impact. And what we mean by compassion-driven research is looking at what is really required at the most vulnerable strata of the society and bringing together scalable solutions towards that. Next slide, please. And we do that, I mean, sorry, the previous slide. Um, and we do that by actually looking at a lot of interdisciplinary research and work. In fact, the milieu of our, our interdisciplinary centers has a special value in terms of the underlying cornerstone being extreme passion, um, uh, uh, focus on what we can really do to be able to benefit society in a very scalable, tangible way. Next slide, please. And all of this has actually resulted in several innovations uh, that has actually solved both regional, national, and international problems. For example, looking at disaster management, we see many, many, many more of these disasters occurring, not only in India, but across the world. How can we really use technology to be able to at least mitigate loss of lives, loss of um, Assets, for example, being able to extend communication networks across the ocean to close to 100, and 100 plus miles into the sea so that the fishermen community can actually take you, make use of telecommunication network and save themselves from potential danger. Um, looking at platforms to be able to connect uh, teachers, the best of teachers, to rural communities through, for example, platforms that we have built called as um, a view, which is really talk to the teacher wherever you are, irrespective of distance and time. Um, next slide, please. Um, looking at phenomenal um, uh, research outcomes in the area of medicine, for example, looking at robotic uh, simulations, doing double arm uh, transplants. For example, hands were never considered to be transplantable organs um, uh, earlier on, but today they are very much so because of some of the treatment possibilities that have come through use of technology and um, uh, key resources to be able to do this. Um, go on, please. Um, as um, I had mentioned in her talk, one of our biggest emphasis in the university has always been veered towards sustainable development. And what do we mean by that? We look at uh, common problems, challenges that most citizens face in terms of uh, looking at uh, energy and environment, water, health, sanitation, um, gender equality, livelihood, skills development, et cetera, and we see what can be some sustainable solutions that not only bring together use of technology, but also the behavioral sciences to be able to change and impact life across the world. We could not have done this without a significant support from a lot of partners, and this is really broad Amrita, next slide please, um, to be ranked first in India as per the Times Higher Education in terms of the impact rankings um, 
that uh, we have earned and also 52nd best in the world to be able to look at various different sustainable development goals such as SDG 4 for quality education, SDG 3 for good health and well-being, SDG 6 for clean water and sanitation, gender equality, etc. to be able to contribute more and more um, at the uh, societal level. Uh, thanks to all of our partners and collaborators across the world, over 200 of them that we work with and who have sent their students also to India to participate in many of these activities. Now with that, I would like to just switch gears here and talk a little bit more about C20. Um, effective policy building really requires a lot of um, thorough research, uh, stakeholder engagement, and taking a balanced approach. And what we did here was to be able to look at policies that are very evidence-based, adaptable, and also that really address emerging challenges. And the four areas, the one specific um, engagement group on technology, security, and transparency looked at these four pillars, which is technology for empowerment, cybersecurity, AI and data for society, transparency, trust, and disinformation. In addition to policy making, we also were, I'm sorry, um, next. Click one more. In addition to policy making, we also did a lot of community awareness and, and a sense of fostering a community involvement to be able to strengthen the policies that we are making to be able to encourage kind of responsible adoption of them and also fostering a lot of collaboration. So the first uh, core issue that we really looked at um, dealt with digital economy, uh, availability of infrastructure across the world. As we know, the digital economy is growing 2.5 times faster than the physical world economy. Um, uh, next slide, please. Not next slide, yeah, next prompt. Uh, yeah, you can just click it through so that the whole slide can be seen. 15% um, of the global GDP comes from the, the digital economy, and it's expected to grow up to 30%. Now, lack of accessibility, availability, and affordability is a significant barrier to sustainable development. And today, the physical infrastructure itself offers a, a barrier to most people that are in rural parts of many countries, only 46% of people actually have access to uh, the internet compared to 82% in the urban areas. And another big uh, challenge is that 61% of the online content is purely in English. Now, parity in access to the internet cannot be achieved unless this is also available, uh, the internet is also available as a multilingual internet to most citizens across the world. And towards that, we really needed to make uh, pos the possibilities to create the internet, to adopt uh, internalized, internationalized domain names, universal acceptance, unicodes, etc. And so those really formed a significant part of our uh, suggestions to the G20 countries. Uh, please click. Uh, India has done phenomenally well in terms of uh, providing uh, digital unified payment interfaces, which has really reformed and transformed many people in rural areas. Amma had mentioned some examples of how actually farmers were able to get into a profit zone even at the end of the first year, primarily because of technology interventions such as these. And, and, and also, I think we really need to be able to create more open source software for public procurement and governments. And I think this will also make a significant impact on availability of resources to do good. The next is re really, the next slide, please, is, uh, relates to cybersecurity. Um, what we know is that uh, today the digital economy is expected to be at least $20.8 trillion worth by 2025, but however, half of that, close to half of that, is going to just go to combat cybercrime. Now, we may think, why do we really need to go so fast in really technology development if half of that we are going to just spend in combating cybercrime? The answer to that is we simply have no choice. The technology is simply is going to go forward, and we really need to address this right now. And the uh, you could say the concerning part of all of this is that uh, targeting critical infrastructure is is a big no-no. And in fact, 20 percent of all um, the, the the these attacks on critical infrastructure has gone up significantly by sponsored nation-state attacks. And and this is something we should all be cognizant about and really speak up to be able to change. 
So we also care about the need for cybersecurity measures in, in emerging technologies such as AI. And, 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 and so the right-hand side graph is really sharing with you the expected um, uh, expenditure on, on cybercrime in the coming years. The good part of it, the next slide please, is that 98% um, of basic security hygiene is enough to protect 98% of the attacks. And, and, and we have recommended, uh, this is probably one of the boldest recommendations we have made, in that, that there be an additional protocol to the Geneva Convention in really prohibiting attacks on critical infrastructures during conflict, and we are seeing one um, as we speak today. Um, also enhancing really the national security policies and defined mechanisms to enforce international standards. So I think I'm just going to go quickly go to the next core issue on AI and data. And again, here we see that 70% of the organizations will be using AI uh, by the year 2030 in some way or the other. And we really need to solidify the ethical development and, save, uh, and safeguard human rights through that. And we hope that working with uh, Glo Boston Global Forum and, and, and others uh, here, we are able to do that in a scalable form. Um, Next slide, please. And, 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 and one of the key recommendations really is that we have such a gap here, and I remember in the last meeting of the Boston Global Forum, this was also discussed that the policy mechanism and regulatory measures related to AI are still very loose and, and not uh, completely discussed uh, and deliberated on, and this is something that's extremely critical as we speak. Go on, please. And the last part of it really dealt with the next slide was dealt with the transparency, trust, and disinformation issues. It is also becoming a, a large uh, problem today because of the fact that uh, uh, false narratives, manipulated content, etc., can spread so virally across the social media with 4.9 billion users today. And fake tweets, uh, in fact, spread 70% faster than true tweets. It's actually a study from MIT here um, on this, and the cost itself is actually close to $78 billion. Uh, so the, the, the biggest challenge here is that we are eroding public trust, um, uh, potential harm to, um, you know, uh, hampering critical thinking and obstructing decision making. And that is really uh, what is, is, is extremely critical in, in terms of really looking at disinformation, misinformation in a, in a significant way. And the important part is just a five-point increase in digital trust will result in an average increase in GDP of $3,000. Now, this is very, very significant, uh, believe it or not. So it's extremely important to be able to develop mechanisms where we can actually enhance trust. Now, with that, I think uh, the recommendations, next slide, please dealt with looking at a shared terminology, establishing national uh, information networks, et cetera. And I think we had significant amount of policy discussions throughout. Um, and, 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 and next slide, please. We had several events across the world uh, to be able to deal with these different specific verticals. And we ended up with two specific cross-cutting recommendations, which included one, education on emerging technologies for, its, for the beneficial use and also mitigation of potential harm. And both of these are equally important to address. Second is the absolute need for a collaborative, multi-stakeholder process for countries to really pr promote secure and an inclusive digital world. We had an excellent set of initiatives that have come out of the C20. Next slide, please. And that has today, next slide, please, close to 22 countries uh, that are participating. Um, next slide, please. Um, as part of the global internet governance, digital empowerment, and uh, security alliance, and, and, and Boston Global Forum is a, a very big part of it as well. We also have technology advancement, um, capacity building. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to quickly go over these. In terms of what we have done towards civil society organizations, specifically as part of C20, and I think I'm going to go to the next slide, and the next, next slide, please. Next slide. 
And this is kind of the summary of the previous slide. Yeah, fine. So this is actually the summary of the entire accomplishments Civil 20 Group had been able to do with over 6,000 civil society organizations coming together to build these policies from 154 countries. Over 12,000 events happen worldwide with an engagement of 4.5 million people. This was the highest ever civil society stakeholder engagement process in the history of G20. With that, I'd like to thank the incredible team that was part of it and also share with you the great news of this agreement with, uh, uh, with uh, BGF, Boston Global Forum, and the Michael Dukakis Institute to take some of these efforts even to further scale. As we can see, several of these policies require a significant amount of research and implementation to be able to get to the masses. And with that, we hope that we can work with all of you together. And thank you all very much for this opportunity to share. I'd like to request Tuan uh, Gwen, uh, Professor Top Patterson, uh, Dr. Nakli, Dr. David to please come on come in front for the MOU, uh, Ms. Allison Richards, um, Gilad, um, Sri uh, Ramu Damodaranji to also please come. Dr. Achuthan, thank you so much. The, um, uh, this is a real opportunity, I think, for the Boston Global Forum, uh, but not necessarily an easy one. Uh, the Boston Global Forum is, is what I would describe as a think tank, uh, and kind of how you get uh, think tanks and universities working together. Uh, they have different kinds of resources and different kinds of uh, outlooks and the like. Uh, most of the partnerships we've had to this point have been uh, with organizations that at least are similar in the way they operate. Uh, some of them much bigger, of course, but uh, they're really thinking about ideas, uh, like the Club de Madrid uh, under Ramu, the uh, UN Academic Impact Program and the like. So uh, it's mainly been the opportunity to kind of sit around, float ideas, refine ideas and the like. Uh, uh, there's a wonderful opportunity to work more closely uh, with the university. Uh, obviously, uh, we could benefit from that same uh, uh, process in, in, in this context, but um, to try to go beyond that, to really uh, take advantage of the special resources and the like uh, that the uh, university can provide, uh, that's a bit of a challenge. Uh, for an organization that really fundamentally is about thinking about ideas, meeting around the table, uh, actually is a bit lean, uh, as all of you know, and its resources and the like. So um, I think this is a wonderful opportunity. Um, I think it's one we have to really think about, cultivate, uh, start things, kind of get, get them going so that uh, the half-life of it isn't like a year, uh, but in fact, a long half-life. Uh, of collaboration. Um, and if any of you have ideas about having heard from uh, Achathan about, Dr. Achathan about um, what their uh, interests are, uh, you can see where they intersect with our own agenda here at the Boston Global Forum and the like. Uh, if you have ideas about uh, what forms that collaboration could take uh, between the two entities, uh, please uh, either let myself or, or Tuan uh, no, and, uh, and we'll take it and pick it up from there. So uh, uh, anyone else have a response, anything they would like to say in response to what, uh, what you've heard so far? Um, because we're, then we're going to take a little uh, five-minute break um, and uh, move into a very different part of the program. Uh, uh, 
celebration of somebody's birthday who might be around the table. Yeah. No, no, I know, but we're going to be, we can't keep up with guilt too long. We've got to get the council generals here. We'll come back to the, we'll have time later in talk. Yeah. So, um, any other, uh, anyone want to um, uh, respond to um, anything you've heard to this point? Um, obviously, uh, Ama is an extraordinary leader and person, and uh, I can't think of a more worthy recipient of the uh, Boston Global Forum's uh, World Peace and Security uh, Award. Um, and uh, you had the opportunity, I think, to really get a sense of uh, her values, uh, the kind of leadership she provides. Uh, you can also understand uh, in her speaking style uh, why she can speak to tens of millions uh, and inspire them uh, and uh, lead them to uh, uh, the good life, uh, uh, not only a life for themselves but a life for others. But, um, but in particular, if you had some immediate thoughts about uh, this possibility of a more close collaboration between uh, the university and uh, the Boston Global Forum. Uh, again, if not, um, and uh, but you have some thoughts, uh, please share them with uh, either Tuan uh, or myself, and uh, and we'll pick up the ball and go from there. So, thank you again, uh, and uh, again, I'd like to congratulate Ama on the uh, on the World Peace and Security Award. So we'll take a, about a two or three minute break. We're running a little bit behind the curve because of uh, the traffic jam. Uh, and then we'll come back for the, uh, the balloons. I'm just kidding about the balloons, but at least the celebratory part. So, uh, 10 years ago, um, 10 years ago in my office at Harvard, um, Tuan and, and Mike, uh, John Quarles from the uh, Harvard Business School were meeting, uh, and out of that meeting came the idea of the Boston Global Forum. And uh, for the past decade, we've had Mike's leadership uh, uh, to guide us. Uh, in this organization. Uh, and today's a special day. We're going to mark uh, Mike's 90th birthday. Uh, and um, we have a, a, a guest that isn't on the program who uh, just happened to walk in. And uh, it's uh, William Galvin, who's uh, uh, Massachusetts Secretary of State, uh, I think now the Dean of all uh, state secretaries of state. Uh, um, and. Uh, longevity, uh, a record that's going to be hard for some future Secretary of State to beat. Uh, but, uh, and Bill has to run almost immediately, uh, but um, I wanted to take uh, advantage of him being here to uh, give him a chance to say a few words. So, Bill. Well, thank you, Tom. I mean, this is, uh, I guess, in a sense, kind of an unexpected treat. I certainly didn't expect to speak this morning. I just wanted to come by and uh, thank the governor for our friendship over many, many years. Uh, I will say most people at 90 don't celebrate their birthday quite this way. But then again, uh, he's always been a remarkable person. I think that's really what most of us who've known him 
uh, have respected that his, not just his endurance, his commitment to principles, his honesty, and his achievements, uh, never a pretentious person, never, never, throughout his entire career, which was of great achievement. Not always easy. We didn't always agree on everything. I just reminded him a few minutes ago, I, I first met him when I was a teenager, he used that word, and I, I'll take it, um, when a mutual friend of ours wanted me to introduce me to him because he was going to run, I think the first time it was going to be for Attorney General in 1966. And uh, I didn't know him. We were in the same, I came from Brighton right across the river. He was from Brookline. So, uh, and the gentleman that was our mutual friend was uh, Greek, of course. And <laughs> uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful thing. Um, he's been a remarkable leader throughout Massachusetts history. Uh, I am now the senior elected official in Massachusetts and have been for some time. Um, and I think, other than perhaps Senator Markey, the only person who's still in office uh, who served with him when he was governor. So it's, it's certainly an opportunity for us to commemorate this most remarkable life of public service. You know, when you think of our history here in Massachusetts, you think of so many great historic figures, especially from the Revolutionary period. But it isn't so much about the history, it's the dedication to public service. And in that vein, I think, you know, I think, for instance, one of the most remarkable public servants we ever produced was John Adams, who continued to serve for a long time. And his son, John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, who actually went back as a member of the House of Representatives and died there. Uh, because of his commitment to service. And Mike Dukakis is in that vein. He, he simply is. There's no other way to describe him. Uh, I must say, as I said a moment ago, and I'm not going to prolong it, I appreciate the opportunity, but I've always found him a little lacking in pretensions, but almost to the point of kind of peculiarities. Having, having the British Council with us this morning, I'm reminded specifically of a rather remarkable uh, opportunity I had. During his campaign for, leading up to running for president in 1988, the year before, um, I was in charge in the legislature of a number of regulated industries, one of which was horse racing and public racing. Horse racing, of course, we don't have it anymore, but, and I have to be honest with you, the governor really wasn't a big fan of horse racing or anything, any of the sin things. I also regulated liquor and gambling, all the bad stuff. So as he was trying to become broader in his appeal as he was going around the country, he decided he better find out about these things. So I was getting these calls periodically to go down to his office. My office at the time was on the fourth floor in the state house, the governor's office on the third floor. And I would go down, you know, fairly often that some issue had arisen he'd heard about, he wanted to get more information about. But I have to be honest, it was becoming a little bit tedious because I, I was getting this call. We had a, one of his employees at the time was a, a, um, a classmate of mine in law school, uh, went on to serve in the judiciary, Peter Agnes. And Peter would call and said, uh, Can you, uh, he needs to talk to you again. He needs to talk to you again. So as I said, it got kind of tedious. So I got in the habit of just racing down. In those days, security wasn't much of an issue. And so you just race down. So I raced in the guy was, I'd open the door and he said, what, what is it now? Well, this particular day, I went down and I opened the door and I was in my shirt sleeves. It was a warm, I recall it was April. It was a warm day. And I had just not even put my coat on. I raced down. And said, what is it? What is it? He says, we have a guest. And I looked across. And I looked across. And I was kind of startled. It was then Prince Charles, now King Charles. <laughs> and I, I, I was stunned. I didn't know what to say. And apparently, the prince was here actually for the opening of the Burberry raincoat store or something. But <laughs> that's the truth. And uh, on Newbury Street, which I don't think is there anymore. In any case, so I said, why, why am I here to the governor? And he said, well, he, no, he's interested in horses. I said, polo ponies, <laughs> polo ponies, <laughs> not racing horses. That's, and I had to then have a conversation with the prince about gambling. But uh, whatever. Uh, he's a remarkable individual. We in Massachusetts are very grateful for his many years of service, which continue, and we wish him many years to go into the future. He's a great guy. Thank you.
Secretary Galvin, thank you so much. And uh, longtime friend and friendship. Uh, so uh, we've got some tributes um, that we're going to start with. Um, Juan Gallego, from, who's the Deputy uh, Chief of Staff for the Lieutenant Governor, uh, has a citation from uh, Governor Maura Healy. Juan, thank you. Hey, good morning, folks. Um, as, as you may know, Juan Gallego here uh, with the governor's office. Uh, and this is a very special moment for me as well because I actually used to be the teaching assistant for Governor Dukakis while I was at Northeastern a few years back. So it's a full circle for me uh, to be here this morning with the governor um, and now working for Governor Healy and Lieutenant Governor Kim Driscoll. And they send their, their regard for being unable to be here with us this morning. Uh, but they wanted to, to make sure that we took a moment to acknowledge uh, his year, years of service to, to our commonwealth and, and really to our country. So I'm just going to read off uh, some sentiments that they sent over. Uh, so on behalf of the residents of the commonwealth of Massachusetts, I congratulate you on the joyous occasion of your 90th birthday, Governor Michael Dukakis. We are grateful to you, Kitty, and your children, John, Andrea, and Cara, for your service to our commonwealth. As the architect of the Massachusetts miracle, you brought honesty and integrity to the governor's office, changing how government is run and who it serves. Your leadership and foresight is visible through the transformation of major transportation hubs by revolutionizing Greater Boston through the big dig and the significant investments across our state. Your policies and values continue to lead and inspire us today to continue to make Massachusetts a more welcoming and progressive place to uh, call home. We thank you for your commitment to us, and we wish you a happy birthday. Happy birthday, Governor. We wish you many more. Awesome. Now we have a couple of videos. Um, from DC, uh, the personalities will be familiar to you as you see them, so. Good evening, Boston Global Forum. I am so sorry that I can't be there with you in person, but I would not miss the opportunity to congratulate our good friend, Governor Michael Dukakis, and wish him a very, very happy 90th birthday. You know, throughout his decades-long career, Governor Dukakis has shown that he is a committed public servant, a tireless leader, and a strong voice for Massachusetts families. When he was first elected as governor back in 1974, he faced some of our Commonwealth's toughest battles. Up against a record deficit and high unemployment, Governor Dukakis took these challenges on with passion and with persistence. And his leadership made a key difference in the lives of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people across Massachusetts. After retiring from politics, Michael brought that same passion and expertise to the classroom, teaching at UCLA, at the University of Hawaii, and at our own Northeastern University. Now, when I first decided to run for the United States Senate back in 2012, Michael sat down with me and he told me the right way to run a campaign. He said, run a grassroots campaign grounded in people, based in the neighborhoods, in the cities, in the towns, all across our state. I listened. In fact, that is exactly what I did. I have been lucky enough to count on Michael's support since that very first campaign, and it's made a world of difference. So let me say this one personally. Michael, thank you again for the work you do day in and day out to benefit families all across Massachusetts and all around the world. Congratulations on this tremendous honor, and I hope you have a very happy 90th birthday.
Good evening, everyone. What a tremendous honor it is to be celebrating the birthday of the man, the legend, my friend, Michael Dukakis, and to Kitty, the indomitable Kitty. We know Mike would not be Mike without you, Kitty. When Michael Dukakis became governor in 1974, we had been waiting for him. He was our generation's leader. He was our conscience because he wasn't just a thinker, he was a doer. As state representative, which I was then in 1974, as governor, what he has done for Massachusetts and the entire country is without measure because you can't spell Dukakis without do. And he is still a doer through the Dukakis Center, to his work increasing access to transportation options, and all it affords for people to his tenacity in making the North-South Rail Link a reality for the region. We'll get it done, Michael. He's a model for the transportation systems he advocates for. He doesn't slow down. I know this firsthand from all of the work I've done with Mike and Kitty over all of the years. During my 2013 uh, Senate race, we had a moment in Lowell where Kitty and Michael we're in Lowell. And Michael was speaking to Cambodians in Lowell through a translator. He talked about the need for democratizing access to opportunity for everyone, especially immigrants. And he told the story of how his own father immigrated to Lowell from Greece to become a doctor. He was able to raise a child who could become governor of Massachusetts. They could have a child who could be running for the presidency of the United States. And the Cambodian people in that room were all nodding their heads, hoping that the American dream could be part of their family's history as well. And here's what I know from that interaction. The Greeks may have invented democracy, but Mike Dukakis invented grassroots politics in Massachusetts. There's an ancient Greek term called agape. It means giving yourself the ability to respond to human suffering. And that's what Michael Dukakis has done every day of his career and his life. He has given immeasurably to the cities and towns of Massachusetts, to the people of Massachusetts and our country, and to our very democracy. To remind us that the potential of our state, our nation, and our democracy rests on our ability to harness the potential of our people. And that is a commitment that Michael Dukakis has delivered on every day of his 90 years. In many ways, everyone who is here knows one thing, that Michael Dukakis just may be the organizing principle of all of our lives. That's how powerful of an influence he's had upon all of us and upon this world that we live in. So happy birthday, Michael. Have a wonderful time. You deserve it. Uh, but I know one thing. You're not slowing down, and you never will. When the uh, Boston Global Forum started, um, <clears throat> we had some discussions about the agenda. and. You know, what issues we were going to take on, uh, what parts of the world we were going to concentrate upon. Um, and uh, there's a natural tendency, I think, uh, for us to think about the U.S. and Europe and those connecting tissues and issues. And uh, Mike, from the beginning, uh, was pushing us to think about Asia and think hard about Asia. Uh, and one of the things that that's brought us is a very close connection. Uh, to Japanese scholars and to officials within the Japanese government. And I have uh, um, a statement I would like to read from uh, Japan's Minister of Economic Security, who also happens to be uh, the, the Minister for Science and Technology, Sandy Takeachi. Dear Professor Michael Dukakis, I extend my heartfelt congratulations on your 90th birthday. Your tenure as the longest serving governor of Massachusetts and your tireless efforts in promoting U.S.-Japan friendship and expanding economic exchanges are deeply appreciated. I express my profound respect for your many years of exemplary achievements, 
and hope that you will continue to thrive with your outstanding abilities and wide network of connections. I wish you good health and happiness. Uh, we're also grateful that uh, several council generals uh, uh, have joined us today, uh, and uh, I think it's only fitting that we start with the uh, Greek council general in Boston, uh, Simeon Tegos. <laughs> Good morning, Governor. Χρόνια πολλά. Happy birthday. Now, uh, it's a great honor to be here with you this great morning as a representative for Greece here in uh, New England. Uh, I just want to point out um, how proud all Greeks and Greek Americans are for uh, Governor Dukakis and his legacy. And this is a universally accepted uh, truth cut across any kind of lines in our community. Everybody love and admire Governor Dukakis. Now, uh, the truth is uh, this unifying factor is just one of the many incredible traits that uh, Governor Dukakis brings to, to the table. And uh, I think I have to to underline that the most important part is the values that Governor Dukakis represents. Because those values are identical exactly with the values that my country represents. Uh, I'm referring to democracy, rule of law, integrity, transparency. So all those years, I think my country couldn't be uh, could not aspire to have a better uh, representative here in United States politics in New England than uh, Governor Dukakis. Uh, he is a thinker, he is a doer, he is our conscience indeed, and uh, we're all so proud of him. So happy birthday, Governor, from all Greeks and uh, Greek Americans here, and uh, Thank you so much. I were so proud of you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Arnaldo Minuti, who is the Consul General uh, of Italy and Boston. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Uh, well, I'm pleased and uh, deeply honored to be here today at the Boston Global Forum's celebration of Governor Michael Dukakis' 19th birthday. In celebrating Governor Dukakis' lifetime achievements, we are inspired to follow his example in creating more inclusive and prosperous future for all people. Governor Dukakis is recognized as a leader in shaping the responsible and ethical use of also artificial intelligence, among other issues, one of the most important challenges of our time. I congratulate Governor Dukakis and honor his legacy and lifelong contribution to public service as governor of Massachusetts and as the co-founder and chairman of the Boston Global Forum. I want to end with Governor Dukakis' own words we must work together to build a world in which all people can live in peace, dignity, and security. A world where economic growth and development serve the needs of all people, not just the privileged few. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and uh, for the privilege to be here representing Italy, the Italian, -American, the Italian and the Italian American community of Massachusetts. And uh, I would like to, to wish uh, to Governor Dukakis happy birthday. Thank you, Governor. Uh, Dr. Peter Abbott, who's the uh, British Consul General uh, to New England. Dr. Mm. Abbott.
Good morning, everybody, and a very, very warm happy birthday to Governor Dukakis. Happy birthday. Um, uh, Tom, uh, Tuan, uh, everybody who's helped organize this morning, uh, Harvard University, huge thanks uh, for convening us uh, here again at the Boston Global Forum. It's great to be uh, with you. Um, Governor Dukakis, uh, as we all heard, extraordinary record of public service, but I think for the international community here, certainly for the British uh, consulate, uh, the foundations that you laid, Governor, uh, for a uh, technology-driven economy uh, here in Boston has benefited not just Massachusetts, uh, not just uh, the United States, but the UK and the entire international community. And I think probably all of my consular colleagues around the table, their economies are benefiting from uh, the extraordinary technological innovations that you laid the groundwork for during the Massachusetts miracle from 1983 to 1991. Uh, so huge thank you uh, to you for that. I think it's fair to say we are all also beneficiaries of the investment that you made uh, in the transport infrastructure uh, in Boston. However, given that you were late due to the traffic this morning, I think that is an unfinished uh, piece of work. <laughs> Um, I wanted just to close uh, by uh, relaying an anecdote uh, that the governor told me last year, uh, which was, believe it or not, the platinum jubilee of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. She also very sadly passed away at the end of that year, but um, we celebrated her platinum jubilee in the first half of the year. Uh, and the gover to governor told me the story of how he, he met Her Majesty the Queen uh, when she visited Boston in 1976 uh, to celebrate America's bicentennial. And she arrived... Uh, on the Royal Yacht uh, Britannia into Boston Harbour, uh, and the governor was there at the bottom of the gangplank uh, to meet her as she came off, uh, off the ship. Um, and the governor and, and, and everybody else uh, in Boston had been told, as everyone is always told, you are not supposed to touch the queen. Uh, if, she, if she extends a hand to have a handshake, that's fine, but under no other circumstances are you to touch the royal personage. Um, Unfortunately uh, for Governor Dukakis, about halfway down the gangplank, uh, the Queen tripped. Uh, and he, <laughs> I hope you don't mind me sharing this, this story, Governor. But Governor, the Governor saw the Queen start to slip down the gangplank and thought, oh my God, what am I going to do? I'm going to have to catch her, but I've been told not to touch her. Uh, fortunately, the Queen uh, is a consummate uh, diplomat and managed to right herself uh, as she was coming down the gangplank and slipped but managed to stand up right at the bottom of the gangplank before the governor had to, uh, had to leap into action. Uh, but it was a lovely anecdote from a wonderful visit uh, by Her Majesty the Queen in 1976. So I will close there uh, just to say, uh, from the United Kingdom, all the people of the United Kingdom, congratulations on a remarkable record of public service and a very, very happy birthday. Dr. A Dr. Abbott, thank you. Um, in defense of Boston transportation, I've been in London, I think on a, at, at least three occasions where there was a tube strike. So, uh, uh, and uh, now uh, we're going to hear from uh, Albert Fierro, who's the Consul General uh, uh, in Boston for, for Mexico. Uh, Alberto. Good morning, everyone. I met Governor Dukakis for the first time at a concert in Brookline, and my immediate reaction, and what I later told my colleagues, is how warm he was. By participating in this most deserved celebration, it is clear to me that this is just the first of the many qualities and virtues we all together have come to recognize and value. Governor Dukakis is true, a, a true statesman, and as such has kept on being a voice of reason, and as far as I know, a Spanish-speaking voice of reason. I do appreciate that throughout his political and academic career, he has always maintained objectivity and a profound intelligence to understand the subtleties and strengths of the Mexico-US relationship. Governor Dukakis drove the Massachusetts economy, as we have heard many times this morning, uh, during his term, time in office and helped foster the very rich innovation economy the state enjoys today. By doing this, 
as well as with the creation of what today is the Michael Dukakis Institute for Leadership and Innovation. Governor Dukakis has, without knowing it, open spaces for members of the Mexican community to thrive in Massachusetts and to contribute then and today to this amazing pole of intellectual curiosity and discovery. As Consul General of Mexico here, I can only thank you, Governor, for this and wish you a very, very happy birthday. Mr. Fierro, thank you so much. Um, we were trying to think of a way to uh, mark this occasion uh, and also kind of leave a, a, a bit of an imprint of what the Boston Global Forum uh, is all about, um, and it's about ideas, and, uh, and we thought, well, uh, let's put some of those down in a book. Um, and, uh, and we're launching a book uh, this morning, uh, Governor Michael Dukakis, From Massachusetts Miracle to AIWS, The Age of Global Enlightenment. Uh, uh, Tuan, you want to lead us off on uh, talking about the book? I'm so moved today uh, after the 90th birthday of my dear leader, Governor Michael Dukakis. Many our dear guests on the guest talk already. I don't want to say so much, but very special. My life here more than 12 years, nearly 13 years, and uh, I'm so moved with my dear leader, Governor Michael Dukakis. He is uh, my uh, a beacon, beacon of inspiration and leadership for my journey in Boston. And also I say thank you and highly grateful and so more with my two dear friends today in the room, Tom Peterson, co-founder of Boston Global Forum, and my dear friend, Tommy Valerie, more nearly 30 years friendship. And uh, <coughs> governor, just yes, for my heart and for my life, I think he as my dear father. He inspired me, make me confidence, and we work very, very much. And I, I have changed to work with many leaders, a friend with many leaders in the world. We have four pillars, the US, Europe, India, Japan. And I have to say, I, very, very rarely, a kindness, warm heart leader. And I think I'm so innocent <laughs> at my dear leader, Governor Maduka, Christ, so kindness. And I don't want to say more. Everything that is uh, from our, my dear friends, dear contributor for Boston Global Forum, we make the book that is, uh, you see, that is the cover. Today, we official launch the book. We start from April 26th conference at Harvard Faculty Club. At that time, we start launch and uh, content. And now we are everything finished, designed. And uh, we will <coughs> official version on 15th of November. Why? Because we would like to put many, many great content today. One speech from all our leaders and friends at this event, special event, to the book and update. We make special uh, book that from governor, from Massachusetts Miracle to his 11 year for to lead and inspire our society, our work for AI or society that are recognized from many, many high impact, important forums, conference, and event at the C20, Z20 summit in India, from in Japan, in Europe, Riga conference, and many conference, and we have, we prepare to launch a new initiative yeah, with my dear friend, prepare to do that. And uh, yeah, I don't want to say very much more. 
I only want to say that the governor, we are very, very historical and memorial moment in this event. We are, I think the, in the future, yeah, the event in our heart, in our memory for a long time. My dear father, Michael Luca Christ, yeah. I, many, I, many times I talk with him. He's uh, my father, dear father, and dear leader. Thank you so much for your coming here with Boston Global Forum, and special my two dear friends here, and uh, also everything we will build and promote, introduce in AIWS City House of Honors. We are many le dear leaders join with us, and we honor them, all leaders for peace and security at uh, AMA today. We will have very honored place in AIWS City. We start with Club de Marit, with more than 100 former president, prime minister in the world. We build that to bring uh, contribution concept and twist of our leader to make the world better. The kindness asked Governor Michael Dukakis want to do that. Thank you so much. Yeah, we are very honored to introduce the book and we will, we will send you. I don't want to spend so much time so for my colleagues to talk more. So many dear leaders, many contributors of Boston Global Forum uh, in the book. Yeah. Please, uh, <coughs> that's quick. Yeah. So thank you so much. And uh, yeah, for my next dear friends, talk. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Uh, next, we'll hear from uh, Ramud de Mordoran, um, quite a longtime friend now of Boston Global Forum. Um, and he was the first uh, chief of the uh, UN uh, Academic Impact Program. Remove. Come on. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Tom. I hope the, the reality is a little more substantive than the shadow you must have seen. I'm very grateful to be here because it brings back uh, distinguished governor Rivyard Swamiji, my dear friend Tuan, Tom, all of you. A recollection of my own first awareness of the word or the term or the idea of Massachusetts. I think I must have been 10 years old, and this was, as you will imagine, a prehistoric age before Walkmen or iPods or even CDs. And we used to get these long playing records in India imported from the United States. And suddenly, a song caught the imagination of all of young India, a song called Massachusetts by the Bee Gees. And those of you who are familiar with that song will remain, remember the one line in it, Massachusetts is a place I've seen. And the irony was that the singers, Barry, and Robin and Morris Gibbs had never been to Massachusetts. They'd never seen it. And yet they spoke of having been there, of having seen it, because it was something so tactile, so immediate to the human mind. And I thought back to, to my father, who 80 years ago was in a prison cell in our state of Kerala, imprisoned by the British for daring to participate in our national struggle for independence under Mahatma Gandhi. And how in that cell, he brought himself up on the history of the world and read about the role that this city, Boston, has played in the history of the United States, but more than that, in the history of the world, little realizing that just 10 years later, India would be free, and he would be walking the streets of the city 
as a student at the Fletcher School. I think of my dear and cherished friend Thuan, growing up in a country that was physically, mentally, and dare I say spiritually at war with the United States, never dreaming that one day he would found or co-found a global forum in the city named for the city. You, Governor Dukakis, have been responsible, as all of us have attested, to the miracle that is Massachusetts. But beyond that, you have created what the very ponderous words of our program have called a democratic, a humanitarian, and optimized society which I would like to bring into slightly more lay terms, a society based on deep understanding, a society based upon kindness, a society based upon innovation. And you started it all. When you were governor, you said, we must go international with a vengeance. This was your State of the State address in 1990. Our children's schools must learn geography, countries other themselves, to be able to truly understand the countries in which they live. Today, as it happens, is also another 90th birthday by another distinguished citizen of Boston, my compatriot, Dr. Amartya Sen. And Dr. Sen has spoken about human rights as the acknowledgement that we are part of something larger than ourselves. That deep understanding that Governor Dukakis brought to the table. And we've spoken about the infrastructure of Boston, about its limitations, its challenges, but let's remember also what the governor said at that time, let opportunity be our watchword. And the fact that, as he mentioned, we need a connection between the north and the south transportation lines of this great city so that people can move freely. Think of that as a metaphor for our world, of a link between a historically affluent north and an emergent south which, as Swamiji and Krishna Sri pointed out in the context of the G20 and the Civil 20 and the benediction and guidance of Amma, we are now trying to create. Let us think of kindness, of all that Governor Dukakis did to make life easier for every individual, whether in terms of health insurance or being able to go and get a marriage license in the afternoon starting your morning as a bachelor, ending the day as a husband. That is kindness personified in government. Let us think of innovation. Governor Dukakis spoke at that time of the new tech industries which were dotting the landscape of the city, 1990. Where are we now? We have new tech industries that have made the city the beacon of the United States and the world but also new tech industries around the world which have reached out to the citizens of this great city and nation, making their lives easier, but also possibly much more complex, as the governor has said, the promise as well as the perils of AI offer before us. And we think of innovation at its most obvious and human levels. In his campaign for the presidency of the United States in 1988, Governor Dukakis spoke about a possible conference in Davenport to harness the energies and the potential of the state's literal to the Mississippi River, from the Iron Range of Minnesota to the plains of Louisiana. Find energy and creativity where it is. Innovate. And that really brings me back to my last point. I began with a song. I'd like to end with a quotation from another song, the song Ripple 
by Grateful Dead, in which Jerry Garcia sings of, let it be known that there is a fountain that was not made by the hands of men. The hands of men are finite, sometimes infirm, sometimes weak. But we need that acknowledgement which the constitution of this great state drafted by John Adams so eloquently states that there is a creator, there is a supreme being, there is the preserver of the universe. And it manifests itself in so many forms. Just go beyond that room where we had coffee a little while ago to the room next to it, and you'll find these two gigantic Buddhist tankas, an affirmation of one particular faith. This morning, I was sitting at breakfast with my cherished friend, Martin. And as an aside, let me advise all of you, never have breakfast with a theologian because he will always make so important a point that the toast will not reach your lips. So you will leave the breakfast spiritually enriched, but physically hungry. That said, what Martin told me about the definition of an atheist will always remain with me, because atheism, he said, is a form of self-affirmation, that I am who I am. But be that as it may, even if you are who you are, you are your own creator. So respect yourself, as the Constitution says. It does not enjoin you to create a supreme or an alien human being if you choose not to. If you do choose to worship your God, go there. Go to what Amma in her message a little while ago spoke of that infinite ocean that the solace of faith provides to us, no matter in whom that faith is invested. Tom was generous in referring to the United Nations academic impact. When I was asked to devise it and lead it 15 years ago by Secretary General Ban Ki-moon, he said, you know, Ramu, there are some things that are beyond governments. Swamiji was mentioning how this year, at the end of the C20 deliberations, when we saw that long list of possibilities that Krishna Shri shared with us, Amma said, don't expect governments to handle this. It will be for you. The you, the us, is what this forum is. The you, this us, is what Governor Dukakis has made Massachusetts. There is no second person. There is no third person. There is just one first person invested in herself, but in that investment, invested in the many. So let me, if we could have that final slide, leave you with one closing thought. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we'll hear from uh, Nasli Chukri, who's uh, a member of the Boston Global Forum and uh, of the board and uh, has been with us nearly from the beginning. She wasn't in the room for the founding, but you've been in the room almost every time since. Nasli. Thank you, and I shall be brief. I'd like to come back, bring you back to Michael Dukakis, the persona, the persona of, of Michael Dukakis. Um, as the individual, the statement, the manager, the leader, the collaborator, the problem solver, and the inspire of, inspirer of a, of a better future. So everyone who has worked with Michael Dukakis um, recognizes these characteristics. Um, but I'd like to just expand a little bit on this. Uh, in interactions with others, um, he has always shown calm and compassion. Uh, differences of views are dealt with in equilibrium and balance. And priorities, the priorities that you bring to him or discuss with him, are reviewed and assessed with efficiency and requisite equity. Um, and very few of us can do that very well. In addition, 
when he notes errors in your logic, um, he corrects them with a certain degree of kindness and grace. Um, and visions of a better future that he puts forth are presented with power and with uh, persuasion. And in that course, he steers with the respect for others and the others respect him. So we talk about the future, but let me remind you that the future is already here. Um, we are slow in recognizing it in large part because we are still anchored in some powerful ways in, in the 20th century and its uh, legacies. But the realities of the future, we're beginning to, to see some of those glimmers of the world we are living in, uh, but we're not exactly sure how to manage that. And the fact is that we live in, in, in three worlds, as, as you know. Uh, we live in our world, which is a social, geopolitical, human uh, society. Um, we also live in the natural environment, life-supporting properties, and we put these two things more or less separately. We're beginning to think about connections as we pay the price for damaging the natural environment. And then we live in the cyber domain. Uh, currently with the internet at its core and with very many future internets, and the dilemmas we have at this point in time is that we haven't quite connected strategically, intellectually, theoretically, or even computationally, those three, those three realities we'll, we live in. These are not autonomous anymore, they're interconnected, but very few of us can really pull together what the connections uh, really are. So we're faced with technological change, we know that, but it's technological change and advances that are really moving very rapidly, perhaps faster than, than we are able to, to manage that. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to just conclude with something I've just discovered, which is important to the AI realities and to the world and to the issues of governance. Um, according to the OECD observatory, there are about 74 countries that have formal official AI policies. Now, I find that interesting because we don't know, I happen not to know what the core, the common core might be. I don't know what the outliers are, haven't gotten to that yet. Um, and is the common core among them robust enough that we can begin to think about governance of AI, with AI, for AI, and with the ethics involved? Um, are the outliers um, so outrageous that we want to ignore them? or we want to integrate them. And I would consider that a, a really important uh, set of issues that uh, we would address. And I'm happy to say that at least at MIT, we've begun to think about uh, <clears throat> this corpus of policies that um, require closer assessment, closer analysis, and they bear on an issue of great importance to the governor. So with this, I thank you. Nasley, thank you. So, um, you know, what would a birthday party be without cards and gifts? So, um, I want to stand here for this part of, uh, before we hear from Mike, uh, so that he can see, um, you know, that part of the, uh, you know, when you stand over here, uh, my, you're out of sight of Mike, and Mike is out of sight of you, so uh, he's seen less of this uh, celebration of his birthday, I think, than anyone in the room. So, um, but uh, there's a card circulating, Mike. Um, I don't know where it is, um, but... Um, that's the signature, it has on it the signature of the people here today. Um, uh, now, I went to uh, four stores yesterday um, looking for a birthday card that said 90th birthday. Um, the closest I could get was 80th birthday. So, um, so I got a nine-year-old birthday and added a zero, Mike, and... Uh, this one has the signature of your fellow board members, and we're so grateful uh, for your leadership these last 10 years. And uh, 
It's been a privilege to be on the board. Uh, thank you very much, Mike. Now, if you've been on a Zoom with Mike, uh, he knows very little about technology. Uh, we talk about AI a lot, but uh, when you see him on the screen, it's not Mike Dukakis, it's John Dukakis, uh, his son. Uh, and uh, John is actually the, uh, the tech guru, um, and if there's a problem, uh, John uh, straightens it out. So um, this little gift, Mike, when you open it, is old technology. Uh, to use it, all you're gonna need is a pen. So uh, we'll put this here for you. Uh, one more. I got it. So, Mike, uh, this is a map of Boston. Now, um, when you go to the antique stores in Boston, you can find tons of maps of old Boston. Uh, what's hard to do is to find one from about 1933. Uh, so this one's from 1926. Um, and uh, it's got all of the main buildings in Boston. And right at the center is Filene. So if you've been in Boston for a long period of time, you know Filene. Uh, but also on here, you see the, gov the uh, state capitol uh, where you had your office as governor. and. Uh, I think you'll also see on here many of the haunts uh, that you visited uh, uh, when you were in school in, in Brookline, Massachusetts. So um, uh, we'll get this to you, Mike. But uh, happy birthday, Mike. The floor is yours, Mike, if you want to. Deliver some remarks? Yeah, please. Tom, thank you very, very much, and thanks to all of you. Um, I'm not a big one for celebrations, as many of you know. Um, but this is very special, and uh, being part of a thinking, working, and contributing organization like this one is a very important part of my life, and I hope of your life. As I look around this room, a lot of good people have done a lot of very good work, some of whom we've heard from today. And, uh, and I'm happy to be part of that. Um, this has been an interesting day and a week. Um, Kitty had a fall down the stairs. And she's going to be OK, but she's not here today because she's in the hospital, briefly, we hope. Um, and I got a good start this morning. Got up at 6 o'clock, uh, went to work, uh, checked in with folks, and proceeded to have breakfast and get ready for all of you. Unfortunately, Greeks have a tendency to use their hands when they speak. And it's a natural trait, there's no question about it. But I thought things were going to be perfect this morning. And as I was gesturing about something at the breakfast table, one of my hands hit the breakfast. And I was suddenly covered with <laughs> with cereal and milk. So, with all due respect to people trying to protect, my, protect me, um, I wasn't late here because of the traffic. I was late because I had to change my clothes because I was covered with milk 
and, and cereal. Anyway, fortunately, thanks to lots of good people, I got here uh, reasonably on time. Missed by a bit, but not too much. And uh, obviously, uh, this is a very special moment for me. And again, I'm sorry that Kitty isn't with us, but she had a fall a few days ago, and she's going to be okay. She's going to be okay, but um, can't be here today. Uh, let me just say a few words about uh, the state of the world, if I can, and uh, where we're headed. Um, for whatever reason, I'm somebody who believes strongly that the international community, working together, can make this a better place and a better world, and do so not with conflict, but with compassion and peacemaking and uh, all of the things we need to to make this a better and a, and a more peaceful world. Um, I'm sure I don't have to tell you that uh, this is not the kind of world that I hope we're going to be creating for our kids and grandkids. Uh, and there are reasons for this, and I don't want to get into those. But I will say to all of you that uh, being part of this organization and uh, being in a position where I could work with so many of you in ways that I hope over time will contribute to uh, a peaceful settlement of, dis 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 of disputes um, is, this, is the most important work we can make. Um, so I want to say thanks to all of you for being part of this, for giving me the opportunity to serve in a way that uh, permits me also to bring back my parents and uh, who they were. They were remarkable people, folks. Both Greek immigrants. My dad was 16, my mother was nine. She came over from central Greece, from Larissa, um, at the age of nine. And so far as we can determine, she was either the first or one of the first Greek young women ever to go away to college and graduate Phi Beta Kappa in 1925. How she did it, I have no idea. A lot of it had to do with the help of a elementary school principal in Haverhill, Massachusetts. And as any of you know in this room, we all can't get there without help of people that welcomed us to this country. And it's such an important part of what this country is all about. I don't know how these kids do it these days. I mean, they come over here, they can't speak the language. Um, their parents, in many cases, are working class folks. And they do incredible things. Go to one of the hospitals these days and just walk around and ask people where they're from, how they got there. Uh, it's remarkable, and it's one of the great strengths of this country of ours, and we're benefiting from that contribution in so many ways. Um, I wish we could, do, we could do more about the issue of violence in this country, but unfortunately that's an issue that we've got to deal with effectively as well. But it is a fact, folks that Massachusetts is the, is the safest state in the country, 50th out of 50 when it comes to the amount of violence that we face, which doesn't excuse some of the things that we've lived through in the last just few weeks, but tells you something about the ability of an incredible group of people from all kinds of backgrounds from all over the world to create a society which 
I'd like to think, notwithstanding these issues, uh, can do remarkable things and bring up a new generation of young people that are really extraordinary in so, so many ways. And my parents were part of that movement. Um, in fact, uh, one of our dear friends who sends us postcards from time to time uh, does that, and uh, she's, she's a wonderful person. But the one that I like the most is Calimera. Now, the Greeks in the room will tell you that that is good morning, but it's more than good morning. It really says a lot, Calimera. Welcome. Come. We need you. Let me say a big, th big thanks to, to all of you who came today. I apologize for <laughs> my accident at the breakfast table, but so I'm, I'm not wearing a tie, even though I wanted very much to do so, just to please Tuan. But uh, let me simply conclude, folks, by saying that uh, we have much to do. Um, we're a remarkable country and a remarkable state in so many ways. And I'm just very proud to be part of it, to grow up in it, to be raising my kids and grandkids, to be good citizens, I hope and expect, and to have the opportunity to spend another 20 years, maybe not 20, I guess that's a little excessive, but 10 years, 10 years anyway. My mother lived until she was nine months short of 100. So I'm planning to stick around for a while. And I just want to say a big, big thank you to all of you for being part of that life, for giving me and my family the opportunity to contribute it, and to, uh, to say to all of you that uh, it's, it's an interesting thing to be able to come to this country, as my parents did, to uh, do well. My dad became a doctor. My mother was a, was a Phi Bay, for heaven's sake, you know. Um, but also to, uh, to thank you for the privilege of making a contribution to us and to our lives. And, uh, I'm very proud of that. Thank you, thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, and uh, again, happy birthday, and uh, a deep thanks for the leadership you've given the Boston Global Forum over these last 10 years, and for a much longer period to Massachusetts, the United States, and the world. Um, uh, we do want to uh, let you know about two uh, initiatives that we, um, um, that we, uh, the Boston Global Forum is, is uh, embarking on. And uh, so I don't know, uh, David, whether uh, you and John and Thomas are going to present different, separately or together. What's the? Separate. Separately. OK, I think John, I think John Clevenger, I think you're up first. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I really want to thank you for the opportunity to do this. Um, and the vision and the values has been exhibited here. I, I had never heard Alma speak before, and I have to say I was extremely moved by her. 
not only her, her comments, but how she spoke and her notion of science and the values implied in that. And so when we talk about a nature-based AI, I mean, I, it was so resonant with what she started to say, <laughs> we're nodding heads here. And, and also the values that go and how you think about AI uh, were so implicit in with the comments that have happened to date. And I'd like to just briefly talk about sort of a joint initiative we're taking um, with the Active Inference Institute, in which I'm a board member, that is pursuing a nature-based AI. It's a technology group, a sort of a grassroots technology group um, that I think is very leading edge. And, and some of the key participants are Carl Friston, who had basically uh, started this field, but with many other people. It's just you, you can't see a single man. Um, and then the collaboration of that sort of technology group with a policy group I think is a great opportunity. Um, so let me, I'd just like to summarize the letter uh, that we wrote. It started out with a, a letter sort of trying to differentiate um, our point of view um, from what is the prevailing, uh, so the, the prevailing narrative about what artificial intelligence is. And what we think is, is that the way it's being cast is a sort of monolithic super intelligence. You hear this all over the place, that there's this machine intelligence that's going to take over. Uh, it creates an existential risk. Um, and there's a presumption that certain key players, say the big tech companies, are really sort of in a privileged position to affect the course of this. Um, and that that they, in a sense, should lead this, and, and, and it's really cast in the concept of a, of a mechanized machine-like intelligence. And our position is that actually there's a science of intelligences, a science of living things, a biology, neuroscience, and even physics that's very resonant with what Amo is saying. I, I keep coming back to that. And that the current narrative is, is sort of public narratives is skewed. And there needs to be an alternative, not just an alternative voice, but an alternative kinds of research in integrating that with um, policy. So the integration of technology and policy. Another, do the change, please. Thank you. And, and so what I'm going to do is so why, why we're doing this joint initiative, why the signatory letter. And I'd like to, to have your indulgence to become a bit of geek out a little bit on, on the, this next generation AI, because I think it's very important. And it's a new science. And I think we really have to understand it as a science. And to address a lot of the issues that people are concerned about, you really have to go deep into the science and be able to create a science evidence-based response. So right now, you have this idea of AI that's a transformational of power to create and deceive. It can be any things. You don't know really what you're looking at, but in a sense, you can change nature. And this can be very frightening. Next slide. And there's a wonderful New Yorker uh, cover. I don't know if other people have seen it, but I think it's, it takes off an Escher. No, next slide, please. <laughs> um, takes off the, uh, the, the uh, Escher, the Escher uh, drawing. Um, so who defines whom? Is the machine going to define us or are we going to define the machine? Is that the, really the dilemma that we have? And how do we proceed? Next slide, please. And there is a sense of this Moloch. This is a, this is a narrative that's very pre prevalent in Silicon Valley where I spent a lot of time. It's sort of like this, this God that we have to yield to that says that there's a single kind of intelligence. And this is what we call abiotic AI. It's not biological, it's me mechanical. And there's sort of this submission to the, the machine. Next slide, please. And what I would argue is, is that, and this is, I'm always making these comments too, it's not, it's not so much, the, it's just our projections onto it. It's not what reality, reality really is. Um, and so we're, we're, we're next slide please. Um, we have this notion of, of, of that AI is a singular intelligence. I was at the MIT AI lab getting my PhD when Marvin made, Minsky would made this comment, I'll go read this, in three to six years, We'll have machines with a general intelligence of a human being. If we're lucky, they will decide to keep us as pets. And that was 1970. I don't think that's happened yet. Um, but there was a, that notion, there's sort of this Promethean idea that if we can fit, crack this super intelligence, then we're going to unleash something and solve something. We'll, we'll be part of something very powerful. Next slide, please. And, and there was Joe Meisenbaum, 
some people might know, here was at MIT at the time, and he developed a program uh, called ELISA, which basically was an extremely simple program. Um, it was a, a simulated analyst. And, and people projected enormous intelligence upon that. They assumed uh, that they had cracked the, the, the code of what it was to be a psychiatrist and this thing. And he did this as an illustration of how it could be deceiving. It was like very simple code seems to ha have great intelligence. Now, not to say that you can't do great intelligence, but this idea of projecting more onto it than it is, it's more a reflection of us than it. Next slide, please. So they're really very, I would like to comment on some of the limitations of the current AI initiatives. I think it's very important to understand that. Next slide, please. And one of the limits were the LLMs, I said abbreviation is large language models. And I have to say that as a linguist, I mean, I, I did my PhD in computational linguistics and AI and wrote a book and everything on that. There's some extraordinary advances that have been made in that. But there's some significant limitations, and this is the projection problem. They cannot self-reflect. They cannot self-correct. They're really corpus-bound. You're, so, you're understanding a structure of a course with corpus with billions of parameters, but there's no sense of itself and reflecting upon itself. And there's no really independent scientific criteria for independent, so is this a good model or not? This is engineering, it's not science. Now, I, they've done some great innovations with that engineering and using scientific methods, but it's really still engineering. And it, importantly, it cannot explain or adaptively update itself. And this is really key, because it's a black box. And in that black box, you have no idea of why it's doing what it's doing. And hence, comments, they hallucinate. And you don't know why and they're going to hallucinate or when they're not going to hallucinate. So it's not based upon underlying cause models, nor does it have any notion, oh, yes, <laughs> any notion of, of, of what it, the level of certainty or uncertainty about its claims are. OK, now we go to the next slide here. And this is the, the famous. Um, a uh, hype, uh, hype cycle of a Gartner group was a, a major uh, research group. And I know you can't read all the little dots there, but what I, I'd, like, I'd like to point out, there is a black dot that is at the top of the hype cycle, which is the a, a generative AI. That's sort of where we are now. On the bottom, there's something called first principles AI. That's what we're arguing for. It's based upon science. And they're saying it's two to five years out, whereas saying, Generative AI in a hype cycle, that's where we are in it, is like 10 years out. And this whole notion of an artificial general intelligence, you have the little red triangles you can't see up there, is like 10 years out. So I think there's a misframing, and this is of, of where the technology is, what the critical technologies are, and what the time scales are. This is not to minimize the negative impact that AI can do, but it's, it's, we're not, I think we're seeing it through an improper lens. Even DARPA, uh, who's obviously tracking this, has this notion of second and third de generation uh, AI. And what we're currently in is a second generation, AI, not a third generation. AI. And this new kind of third generation AI, we are calling many words for it, but active inference, and I'll explain that a little more, where you have something that can actually reflect and abstract and develop causal models and reflect upon itself. That we can understand why it's doing what it's doing. We can understand how well it understands something or doesn't understand something. And so there's a whole merging science. And this is where I'm very, very excited. And that you'll hear Tom will come up later and he'll, he'll resonate with us. But there's a really a science of collective cognition that's grounded in nature and life. I mean, can we really think of the scientific principles underlying cognition and an extent? I think we're really on the cusp of that. And part of that is. Judea Pearl is a, is a key figure who's a part of this group. And his work has been actually fundamental. And I won't go into the, the details of it, but he has this concept of called Markov blankets, which is really critical in statistics and actually understanding the physics of living things. And his work has informed the notion there may be a natural or next slide. So we get, I'm sorry, I get, we got, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Um, next slide, please. Next slide, I'm sorry, I really got ahead of myself here. Next slide. Yeah, sorry. Um, there's, there's nature's ordering principles, a free energy principle. 
And this is sort of a fundamental principle of physics. And it makes the claim that all forms of life, at all scales, all matters, and all forms of matter. I and mean, it's really, you can understand things at multiple scales, and that what living things try to do is reduce entropy and uncertainty. And to be alive is to be able to or survive, is able to make predictions and maintain the state of who you are. Next slide, please. So we have Carl Friston, who um, is a very interesting fellow. He's, a, he's an MD. Um, he's also a neuroscientist. He's, he's a mathematician, a physicist. He's like 270,000 citations. He developed a new form of neuroimaging. Um, and, and he's sort of developed this concept of physics of living things. And it's called active inference and in, 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 uh, Bayesian mechanics. And so they have all living things have this generative models organized on these Bayesian principles. You can describe things at different scales. You can describe the most simple form of life to the most complex form of human organization from a similar perspective. Next slide, please. And here in, 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 uh, in, in Boston at Tufts, there's some really interesting work being done by Michael Levin um, and Levin Labs in the Allen Discovery Center. He's a, he's a biologist, a computational biologist, and I'll just describe, so his view of intelligence is biologically based. It's like a uniform thing, very much what, like Amma was saying, with the wave of the ocean and implicit life. He said, our goal is to develop generative conceptual frameworks that help us detect, understand, predict, and communicate with truly diverse intelligences including cells, tissues, organs, synthetic living constructs, robots, and software base. So you're cutting across multiple disciplines at multiple scales. Next slide, please. And so we have work being done here, with David's work, and also the work being done by Michael. And Carl Fritzman's work was just recently published uh, at the MIT Press on Active Inference. Next slide, please. So the issue here is in understanding our intelligence is have some ground truth. I mean, this is where the real danger happens, and this is where the misinformation happens. This is where the capture happens. And it was talked to earlier, one of the earlier speakers say the whole idea of data providencing, you know, security, privacy, verification, attribution of data, extremely important in being able to a trusted system. And it has to be really independent. And then it really has to be explicit. It has to be human explainable and testable, and models for any kind of claims it does. You, this you can't do with current models, because there's, un, there's not any underlying abstract causal model. And so the other thing about living things is that their action within the limits of its design mission to avoid negative externalities, climate, and social. This is the key thing. Living things live in a, a bound. In order to be alive, they have to live within a certain bound. But when you're designing new kind of things, they actually maintain themselves by maintaining their boundaries. This is, a very, this is very different than a machine. Next slide, please. So my question is, can we have a computational scientific method, be the sort of North Star for next generation AI applications? I really think this is really important. Um, and because you can actually computationally codify a scientific method, and you can scale it. And it becomes the sort of basis for ground truth. Next slide, please. So active, I'll just give a little background on Active Inference Institute. I mean, it is an interdisciplinary focus on what we call, I would call biotic or AI, uh, biologically based AI. And they have a, a large education program with live stream videos and courses and reading groups. Uh, it's very much a grassroots group so in, in keeping with our tradition here. Um, and it has a research uh, element to it. Open software, very much in the open software. They have own journal. They believe the concept of distributed science, so the idea of having many participants in it. And they have different symp symposiums. And they're building out a global ecosystem of, of educators and contributors. So to me, it's a great combination of skills. And there's a link here I can share with people for the signatory letter for joining this effort. Next slide, please. So I think what I what I like to, to, to emphasize here is that Boston Global Forum and Active Inference Institute can provide an integration of policy and, and science and technology. This has been one of my great hopes. I was at the Berkman Center for ten years. We did something called a law lab, in which we had computational law, 
You're trying to, you, it's, you cannot look at technology as being something separate. It's really integral to it, and we have to reframe our, our regulatory frameworks. We have to keep pace with the technology, use the technology to understand the appropriate regulatory frameworks. And we need to sort of, sort of apply this concept, the big ground truth of nature-based AI. Basically, computational life, cycle, uh, life sciences in formulating and testing policies. I think this is sort of foundational. Um, and that, again, to, to uh, Amos' comments, recognition and interdependency of all living things that scales and avoidance of ne negative externalities. We can't isolate things. They're all, this is the fact of nature. This is the fact of science. And so, we've, 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 and, and so we really have to bake that in our way of thinking about it. And I think we also can provide sort of new normative criteria for comp through computational neuro neuroscience. We have a, ba a scientific basis. We, right now, we have addictive algorithms out there. They're absolutely destroying the social fabric of our society. They're creating real pathologies in kids. And we don't know how to talk about it. We, we're frame, falsely framing it. So we need a new way of framing it. And I think we have a scientific basis with to frame that. Next slide, please. So I just want to say happy birthday to Michael. You can get 90, you can get 90 uh, uh, candles on a single cake. That's possible to do. So thank you very much. Appreciate you. John, thank you. Um, Tom Keller. Um, we're running a little on the late side, uh, but um, and we do have our kind of a hard close here at noon. So um, you know, maybe um, we could move a little more quickly on uh, if you could. Uh, thank you. It is, uh, is indeed an honor to be here with you. I recognize we're running uh, a bit short on time. So what I'm going to do is try to cover this in just a, you know three to five minutes, give you a sense. But I, um, I, I can't agree with more what was said here earlier in terms of this notion of nature's intelligence. And so uh, from what we heard earlier and what we have seen discussed here previously, uh, there is a real power in understanding uh, how the world of living physics, the world of physics, has actually influenced us and how it provides us a much safer and more uh, uh, a way to go forward to work together to create a better future in line with the kind of things that Michael Dukakis and Anna was sharing earlier. This is truly an important moment for us. So. Um, I just want you to remember what, sort of one thing that we want to walk away with, an AI that has as includes the collective intelligence of humanity is really an important thing that we have to aim as a part of our going forward. How do we use artificial intelligence and uh, the emergent intelligence in nature, how do we use this to create a better, more productive future for the world? A, a world that is actually full of, and we'll see this at the end, something focused on joy rather than rage. Um, next slide, please. So the history goes way back. And if you read this quote, it actually says very much of what we're not recognizing today, that a lot of the knowledge about how we should proceed is tacit, implicit, in our interaction with each other. Not necessarily always in the text that we leave behind or the data we leave behind, but it's important that we develop a sense of interaction and sharing in the development of knowledge. Next slide, please. And so Judea Pearl, who was mentioned earlier, said this simply, you're smarter than your data. There's more to it than the data. And Jeffrey Hinton, one of the inventors of deep learning, has said, we made this up. We can make up something different. So what does that call for? It calls for a move to grounding this in the laws of science. Next slide, please. 
And so I want to call attention here to a quote made by Richard Feynman at the very bottom, which is, this was pointed out earlier, we're only tapping into a tiny bit. We think so proud that we made something like a large language model work. And what Richard Feynman would say, we shouldn't think we're so smart about discovering the world, the world works. We should be amazed at how beautiful and amazing nature is. And that is our, our sense of humility. We need to come to the, the glory of what has been created. Uh, and this a, a attribution of we are privileged to be able to work within this realm. And this concept of grace is very, very important to how we proceed. Next slide, please. So as was pointed out, there are what we, we are not negative on what large language models can do. They're certainly amazing. What we're calling for is let's wrap around that collective intelligence and a grounding in scientific research. Technology independent of scientific research is a dangerous thing. If you allow technology to go on its own, you do get Moloch. And we can, the human issue, if we're left alone, we don't do good things with technology. It is important that we collaborate together in the development of that. Next slide, please. So here's a little thing for you to see. And this is maybe, this has only become deeply known recently that the mathematics that governs the way magnets work or the way bird flocks is the same mathematics that governs deep learning. And that has been published. And so what we're saying, we're tap, or just tapping into, when we're doing deep learning, we're just tapping into the natural intelligence of how things collaborate. Next slide, please. So we can actually take this, and I've been part of a research effort that began about eight years ago to say, how can we apply this idea of collaboration and sharing and listening to each other's views, beliefs about something. How can we turn that in to a model of collectively, how, what, how we collectively bring our knowledge together? This actually works. It's a technology that's available today. Next slide, please. And it can actually, and has been applied to, Th things such as disinformation propagation. How do you? Uh, how do we collectively learn? What are the best ways to deal with that? And then how can that be used to manage misinformation prop propagation, which is something mentioned earlier. So this is an indicator as we, with the Boston Global Forum, as we work on this new framework for AI, we truly are going to be able to have an impact on how it is rolled out and how it impacts uh, the world. Next slide, please. So um, that was a short talk. <laughs> there you go. Um, but I want to call attention to this. Rather than we have allowed AI and social media to do nothing but foster the worst thing that humans can do is a focus on our, ourselves. What's good for me? What's good for me? What's good for me? And as uh, Governor Dukakis has pointed out with his wife, a focus on what's good for others is how we grow together. And that is something that it, it, literally in this AI we can create an environment where we're pushed to listen to others first before we form our own opinions, that we learn together so that when we collaborate, we can bring joy to this rather than rage. Thank you, Tom. Uh, David Swoberstig, uh, also uh, on the board of the Boston Global Forum. David, welcome, as always. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Governor, um, happy birthday, and what a, a pleasure and honor it is for all of us to be here to celebrate you and your inspiration. And um, in a way, today's whole communal event intellectually and collegially is illustrative of this coming together of everything from Ama earlier and the celebration of, of her and, and the work that all of you do to uh, now sort of, as was said, geeking out 
on the sort of academic science side of things, but with a heart. And so that what we're doing is transcending this false dichotomy um, that is a, um, uh, that it is usually put out there in order to do transdisciplinary work and to bring a very human understanding to, uh, to what we're doing. Are, am I doing the slides or? or you? Yeah, next slide. Um, Governor, this is just a, a quote from Hippocrates. And, you know, we go from ama and the spiritual to the material, if you will, and scientific. And the, the notion that the brain is the organ of the mind um, in the context of larger things, and it produces subjective experience as far as we're aware, and uh, behavior. And uh, it does this in this larger context that we're talking about of nature and wondrous things. Um, we are biologic wet material. Jerry Fodor, a philosopher of mind, uh, who I did my thesis on, uh, talked about functionalism, that it, does, it doesn't have to be biologic material. It, on some other planet, in some other universe, it might be something else. It's all about the components of a complex network and how they come together to form emergent functions. And of course, artificial intelligence represents, and generative iterations of it represent um, ways in which through silicon and other mechanisms, we are, uh, as a species, creating other forms of intelligence, but not necessarily the same. Next slide. I will be very quick and I'll condense uh, this because of our time limitation, but we have a lot of techniques now ranging from molecular to the sort of work that I do, which is brain imaging brain systems and circuits. Uh, next slide. And we have ways of understanding now, although it's still very incomplete and a work in progress, um, and one can talk about ultimate limitations or not of it, uh, of ways in which the brain produces mental life and behavior and indeed a sense of self and social interactions and intellectual interactions, which will bring us full circle to what John and, and Tom were talking about. Next. Um, I always love to look at this because we are not how you would have designed us, you know, in 2023. We are this confluence of phylogenetically preserved deep limbic regions that are more automatic, unconscious, emotional, uh, mnemonic, et cetera, combined with these higher order associative abstract cortices. And to understand us and the mess that we are as a species and the mess that we're in is to understand and disorders, whether it's of individual people of their mind, brain, or society, I think, in ways of understanding societal pathologies that we see play out um, in the violence and, and polarization in the world, we have to understand how we are wired um, and then hopefully work with that which we create um, in terms of uh, AI and other approaches to, to see if we can take the best parts of ourselves, if you will, and, and try to minimize, at least at the population level, uh, if not the individual level, some of the, the worst parts of our uh, species. Next. Um, so there is a deep understanding now, a growing understanding of how the brain does this computationally and in terms of modular, hierarchical, feedback, feed forward, emergent, complex systems science, which I won't get into given the hour. Um, but the, the bottom line is that uh, this is just a sampling of the sort of things that were once thought to not be so amenable to scientific investigation that we are now able to think about scientifically in the context of broader conceptions as well. Next. Um, we are in the era of the human connectome where we are literally understanding like a complex neural network, like a complex AI or deep learning system, how we are wired up. It's incomplete, but really growing. Next. Um, we are able to see our brain at rest and patterns of our brain at rest. Um, even when we are, quote, doing nothing, our mind is actually giving us an internal world and allowing us to sense the external world. Next. Uh, we can even talk about the ways in which uh, we can think about the self 
Uh, I was fortunate to be at a conference with the Dalai Lama about the neuroscience of the self and their ways of, of bringing these uh, psychologies together, um, if you will, across cultures, across time and traditions. Next. Um, importantly to this effort that Tom and John are talking about is how our brain represents other people and their intentions and um, or misrepresents them. And we now are in an era where we can start to understand the circuits that underlie that. Next. Um, when these circuits go awry, you can have things like paranoid delusions and schizophrenia. Um, and all that is, on one level, is our otherwise adaptive phylogenetically older threat circuits, because we need to detect threat and react to it, are labeling something as threatening or someone is threatening or some people as threatening when they needn't. But then your brain takes you along, your mind along for the ride, if you will. Next. Um, and we're in an era where we can do something about these things, uh, ranging from psychotherapy to pharmacotherapy to even brain stimulation as we understand these circuits. Next. Um, and um, next. Next. Um, there are ways of quantifying this. My friends will love these sorts of things, and we're going to be able to talk about them. Um, next. And um, this gets back to sort of common principles of free energy principle and the way in which deep learning and neural nets and indeed artificial nets work. Um, and ultimately what we want to do in this forum is bring these together in order to, for good, not for ill. Next. So um, you can even understand political ideologies neurobiologically these days, which is fascinating and could be a whole talk in and of itself why certain people lean left or right, and what are the brain systems that are associated with how we deal with uncertainty or how open we are to other people or not. Next. Uh, moral decision making. Importantly, differences between in-group and out-group. As a species, we evolved to distinguish, unfortunately, although it was adaptive at one point, uh, on one level, uh, primitively, between our own group, as defined by any number of things, and the other. And there's a biology to this that we need to understand because we need to get beyond it and realize that we are all the in-group. <laughs> we are all in it together. Um, next. Um, and the, the way in which we can do this, you know, having to do with collective intelligence and interacting minds, we're now able to even scan the brain and understand how brains, minds, people are literally as well as figuratively in synchrony with one another, and we want to enhance this in a positive way. Next. And so finally, okay, what, what is it that we want to do with this effort in the Boston Global Forum? And thanks to Tuan uh, and everybody for being able to, to support this sort of effort, is we want to combine these worlds of the AI, generative AI, with the, which is changing and developing by the week, with the neuroscience and neuropsychiatry, which is developing at a rapid pace as well, and look at these common models and work together in the ways that John and Tom articulated so eloquently um, to, for, for pro-social rather than antisocial. And we need to understand the biology of the antisocial in order to minimize it and the pro-social in order to maximize it and use these technologies, which as we've said, are reflections of our own brain, but can improve upon it in certain ways or are inferior in other ways in a complementary fashion, in a safe, ethical, moral fashion uh, in order to improve how we can collaborate and work together to get ourselves out of the messes that we get ourselves into and to, to solve the problems that we most urgently need to, to solve together. So with that, um, we look forward to working together with all of you and, and seeing uh, or testing the hypothesis that this convergence can hopefully be fruitful in a way that brings science and humanity together uh, full circle with the earlier part of the program. Thanks. Uh, thank you, David, and, and also John and Tom. This is a really exciting initiative. Uh, 
Next, we're going to hear from Beth Novak from Northeastern. Uh, brings to the table not only the eye of a scholar, but uh, that of a practitioner as well. Beth, welcome. hidden back here. <laughs> um, so I've been asked to talk very briefly at, uh, uh, which I'm going to set my watch so that it is very briefly, um, at the intersection again of AI and humanity as so many people have been talking about. But I want to start by saying a very, very happy birthday. It's a great honor to be here. And I moved to Northeastern, in fact, just a year ago and moved here very much because of a collaboration with the Dukakis Center and because of the values that you have created as a legacy of so many institutions um, that has enabled me to take up my new position as the director of our new university-wide center for social change. So I'll hide back here for a moment um, and just say that this week, for so many of us interested in AI, of course, there was a 20,000 word, 111 page executive order that came out of the White House and just when you finished reading that, there's now 26 pages of single space guidance from the Office of Management and Budget on AI, a uh, very long over awaited policy making, quite sweeping pronouncements about AI coming out of the federal government here. But what is noticeably absent, where there is a deafening silence in all of this paper, is that there is not a single reference to democracy anywhere in any of those documents. So we have policies that we're talking about to avoid biohazards and to ensure a reduction of risk, um, but there is almost no reference anywhere in here to engaging the public in doing any of this work, into asking how can we tap our collective intelligence, the distributed wisdom of people, and we talked a lot earlier about bottom-up and grassroots policy making. There is none of that bottom-up grassroots acknowledgement that people are smart, that intelligence is distributed, and that we need to tap that collective intelligence and wisdom if we're to figure out the best way forward with our technologies. So um, my, I just wanted to come today to say a few minutes that I am concerned about what this risk mindset does for us. And John, you talked earlier eloquently about the relentless naysaying and doomsmanship and the sky is falling, chicken littleism, if that's a word. Uh, that we are bringing to these discussions about AI, and I think missing the, ben missing the opportunity to fully realize the benefits that we're talking about here today, these distinctly human benefits, if we do not put those opportunities for first and foremost. So we need investment in policy, research dollars, and attention to how we can use AI to solve, I think, our hardest problem, which is strengthening our democracy. So this is not a theoretical prescription. I'm not coming you simply to say this is an aspirational ideal. There is work that is going on that we can continue to support. There is a group called the Collective Intelligence Project, and I have the joy of working with them to use AI to enable us to have a scalable conversation with people about the benefits and risks of AI. The wonderful thing that AI can do for us is not simply allow us, as the web has done, to speak but for a change now to be able, since we can analyze content so much more easily, summarize it, uh, categorize it, organize it, can now allow us to be heard. That creates the opportunity for institutions to efficiently tap into this distributed wisdom and expertise. We have people from Taiwan here today. And in Taiwan, Audrey Tang as the digital minister is pathbreaking in building AI into citizen engagement tools, again, so that not only the government, but also the public can listen and be heard. So instead of getting 22 million comments in a net neutrality rulemaking as happened with the FCC, we can then easily sort and bucket those comments into a few things where we can see the themes that are taking place and hear what people are saying. In Helsinki, they're using generative AI not just to, talk, to analyze uh, text-based comments, but to also work with images and pictures. So Urbanist AI is the tech platform that they're using in Helsinki to allow residents and the, com and the government to co-design future visions for the urban landscape. So you can immediately click a button and say, I'd like to see what this would look like with, you know, uh, without a road and with a bike lane and with uh, 
you know, more plants here and more flowers. Or just this week, the Dutch government unveiled, let me see what it's called, DutchCyclingLifestyle.com. It's quite fun. Go in DutchCyclingLifestyle.com, put in your address, click a button, and see what your street would look like if we were in Amsterdam, a.k.a. lots of bikes and not a lot of cars. Um, so these kinds of tools are enabling us to think about what our collective future is that we want and to do it in a participatory way. I'm working with my students at Northeastern and the nonprofit Citizens Foundation in Iceland now to create a project we call Policy Synth. I'll close here. We're collaborating with the Museum of Science to be able to do a scalable national conversation about why we have such a persistent equity gap around literacy here in Boston in particular, but also nationwide. And again, the AI tools are helping us to tap that collective intelligence and expertise. So let me just stop here, and I've used my five minutes now in 20 seconds, and just <laughs> conclude by saying um, that while we need to be wary of the risks, and I'm very delighted by all the guidance that's come out of Washington and out of Brussels, I think we need to resist the fear-mongering to the extent to which it is getting in the way of our asking and answering the question, what can we do with these tech powerful technologies to realize the vision of AI for good? I feel that if we fail to ask and to answer how we can use AI to improve democracy, we will fail to realize that opportunity. And so we must be thinking about how to use AI to unlock CI, artificial intelligence to enable collective intelligence. Thank you. And again, Beth, thank you so much. Uh, I think that's a wonderful message. Uh, Martin, do you want to come up while I talk a little bit about this next initiative? Um, yeah. Uh, Martin, Martin. Yeah, yeah. So, um, one of the things, the second initiative we want to uh, let you know about is kind of where faith and, and religions uh, might fit into the discussions that we've had. Uh, over this period of time. And uh, I had a good chance to spend some time uh, with Martin from uh, the Vatican University uh, just uh, two days ago now, and uh, over at the house. And uh, Martin, welcome. And help us understand this initiative, if you would. Thank you, thank you. Uh, I join you all in wishing happy birthday to our Honorable Michael de Kakis. And you have greetings from, from Italy. Some Italians have spoken before me, so we are just, I'm just joining myself to them. So the, uh, since we have very little time, I wrote a text which will be given to you. So I will just try to summarize the main points here. And the first thing is that um, I'm announcing to you and hope hope that the global Boston Global Forum will be part of us very soon in initiatives of interreligious dialogue. We are working on this team since a long time uh, worldwide, and we're working with the Muslims, with the Hindus, with the Buddhists, with the African religions, and indigenous religions, popular religions with all what we call leaders. Uh, we, we, they, we, those who, where there is a possibility of being a leader, or oh, I don't know how they became leaders, they were voted, they studied to be leaders. But in other cases, in African case, every citizen is a leader of the society. We are all involved in what is culture, therefore, there is no school to become more leader than someone else. So it's a question of uh, 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 saying no, no difference between human and spiritual. Nobody can say I'm the leader of the spiritual aspect of the, of the society, why the others are only of the human part. So that's why it is difficult to have, it has been difficult in time to have in Africa a religion as such, religion and culture goes together. Spiritual and human are alike. Therefore, 
the hierarchy, the hierarchy of value in the community that counts. Today we are celebrating a 90 years old. He must have wisdom in him. If not, the creator would not have allowed him to be to go up to 90 years. Many people don't get to 10, to 20, to 30. And someone in Africa who goes up to that is worthy to be listened to. Wisdom is in the in the uh, is concentrated in those people, and they are natural leaders. They have not been appointed by somebody, and they cannot be removed. They, can be, they cannot be reformed. So I think this is important. This initiative that we have in Rome is bringing together for one week from the 29th of May to the 5th of June, 2024. And I think one of those days, one of the days, particularly the, sec the, no, the, the second of, of June, is an open day. It's a, an open day. And we did not know this before. Uh, well, before I came here, we never knew about the uh, Boston Global Forum. And why not create or request to have a section in that in that second day of the of the Congress or the International Congress, who can see together how to formalize the section and who is who can be a, a part of it. First of all, all of you can be part of it, I think. <laughs> so we're going to Rome. Rome is not just in, anywhere. Going to Rome has you have some benefit. We shall visit Rome and we shall visit Assisi with all the delegation coming, apart from the sections that are going to be held there. And the Pope will receive us, as he usually do, because we have had symposiums in Tokyo, in uh, Chiang Mai, in uh, Thailand, in Africa. No? And so uh, why not this time again in Rome? And why not again we start to move around if you become partners of this wonderful initiative? We have not yet questioned ourselves as interreligious uh, members on the use of uh, uh, IE, we have not yet. Because for us, we think technology is at the service of humanity, of man. It has been created by man. Not even created, it has been uh, generated by man. It's, it's a man's initiative. So we, uh, we don't think uh, it oppresses human, except it is badly used. So it is something that we can encourage because technology is at the service of humanity. And as such, we, we hope it will always be. And it doesn't, disturb, it doesn't disturb spirituality. And many of our congregations, many of our, our religions, they live and, uh, with their faithful spiritual life. So we cannot put that apart as it's nothing. So we have to take care of it. So maybe it's the time to address it. Uh, we may probably address this matter, and you may be the people to bring this into the, into the Congress, into that uh, assembly this, this time. Um, okay. So you, I will leave the text to you to read. I, I, I prepared a text to say, how do Africans leave religion? In order to say, how can they do interreligious dialogue? So I wrote a longer text as it's called. I, I think I don't, uh, <laughs> but I will not read it. You will read it, and then you can comment. And, uh, we will send all your writing, wonderful writing, to every people. Who, That's every right. People. Okay, yeah. he has it already, so he, he will make sure that all of us have it. Yes. Wonderful right. writing. Very okay. wonderful writing. And okay. we deliver immediately. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is that okay? Please. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Martin, thank you. And uh, we'll also post it on the uh, Boston Global Forum site as well as distributing it. Um, and. Uh, Two relatively brief things left. Um, uh, so, uh, and by the way, uh, for Emerita University, obviously there's a good fit here with, with what we're, with what Martin just talked about. And uh, so in some ways you bring two things to our table. Uh, and uh, so thank you very much for being here. Uh, Quinn. 
I'll keep it real short. So I'm Queen, uh, the director of the Boston Group of Community Development. And today we're hosting a concert for Governor Dukakis. So artists uh, sent in video of their performances to congratulate Governor. And um, we'll, because we're, we're short on time today, so we'll post it on our online website. But um, uh, we would like to thank the Shelter Music Boston, the Boston Landmarks Orchestra, the Les is more string quartet from Japan and other artists uh, for their contributions and for thank you for your support to the ce celebration of Governor Dukakis. Uh, we'll play it very shortly, so please enjoy it. Uh. Because of that is the time not so much governor need to come back to the house with Kitty. So all concert we will we, we see on online. And uh, that is uh, our love to Governor Michael Duca Christ. Yeah. So uh, please, uh, we will send you all link and video concert to celebrate. Yeah. Stop. So uh, on behalf uh, our board, a Boston Global Forum, we are very honored to be here to celebrate the 90th birthday of our dear leader, Governor Michael Dukakis. Thank you so much for your coming. And also, very special, very historical moment. On this occasion, we have two initiatives that Governor Michael Dukakis lead 11 year Boston Global Forum. And now, from now, he continue open new initiative, new door, new road for the world with two initiatives already. So we hope all with us together will make these two initiatives happen and ask our heart to celebrate 90th birthday of Governor Michael Dukakis. The road continue from now, from today, with new initiative. Thank you so much. We are very honored and very uh, grateful with Governor today. Historical moment with my dear friend. Thank you. The conference is adjourned. Uh, Mike, thank you. Uh, welcome again, or congratulations again on your 90th. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and uh, we'll have more information available on the initiatives. And please visit our website. Uh, Martin's uh, papers are remarkable, and the concert is quite ph phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs>